church leaders, historians, um, they've been telling us for some years that Christianity is dying in North America. Now, all you have to do is look at Western Europe and the, the soaring cathedrals and the empty pews. And, um, you know, in some ways it probably feels that way. In some ways it feels like the church has lost its sense of place and purpose. Um, there's the rise of secularism all around us. And then we've got our own self-inflicted wounds, you know, like the sex abuse scandals. We could just go down the list of, of all the things. So maybe it's no surprise that today 64% of Americans um, call themselves Christians at all. Uh, compared to 50 years ago when 90% of Americans called themselves Christians. That's a pretty significant drop in 50 years' time. And, uh, you know, it does feel like sometimes Christian values are increasingly marginalized, or at least they're one of many options at the table, right? For many of you, so if, if you're 30 or over, likely you grew up when 50% or more of Christians or of Americans were going to church on a, on a given Sunday morning. Today, less than 20% of Americans are in church on Sunday morning. Now, I would venture to say that on a Sunday morning in June in 2023, maybe even less than that are in church on a Sunday morning. And so it's safe to say that um, you are, we are, a minority, just because of the fact that you're here sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning in June, you are a minority. We are a minority. And the language I've heard some Christians use around this is the word remnant. In fact, I just heard someone, uh, literally yesterday, I overheard a conversation of someone using the word remnant to describe what we are. And it's this word, it's this theme that weaves itself all the way through Scripture, Old Testament, New, Tre New Testament. In fact, it, it showed up in, in the passage that was just read for us, uh, pointing back to the book of Amos. And that word remnant, it means something that's left over, the remainder. Like in a mathematical sense, uh, it's, it's what didn't divide into the whole. If you think about uh, a piece of fabric, you cut the fabric away and it's the scraps or the pieces that are left over or left behind. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, it refers to uh, that community of people that are left over after some sort of a disaster or catastrophe. It's the people left behind after the nation of Israel has been defeated by their enemy and taken into captivity. So it's this, this picture of remnant. And so even though maybe you don't use the word remnant in your kind of everyday vernacular, I don't know. I think sometimes there is this posture, this temptation to act like a particular kind of remnant people. To, to live like people with a remnant identity. There is this sense that we live with a growing feeling of opposition, that our voice is the minority in a majority culture, that, that God's people have endured some sort of invasion and we've lost something or we're in the middle of losing something. And this particular kind of remnant identity, I think it kind of leaves us with two options. Like one option is resistance, like we, we're gonna resist, we're gonna build the walls higher, we're gonna prepare for battle, we're gonna go on the defensive, maybe we'll even go on the offensive, and we're gonna fight for everything that we believe in. Only that's, that's a really difficult way to also practice the Christian discipline of hospitality and, and, and Christian witness, right? And then the other temptation kind of pulls in the opposite direction is just to kind of assimilate to give in. This is what the Israelites faced in exile. It was the temptation to, uh, to give in to the Babylonian way of life, to bow down to the Babylonian gods. And, and here's the thing, uh, the work that it takes to be in the world, but not of the world is a long, lonely work. And so sometimes it's just easier to just give in, maybe even small incremental ways over time. But next thing you know, uh, we're no longer a people set apart. We're no longer a faithful remnant. But I want to suggest that there's a third way. 
And and it's a way that we see in the minor prophets. Pastor Steve has been taking us through, preaching us through the minor prophets this summer. We see this in the minor prophets. We see this in the book of Amos. And I wanna suggest also that we see it in the book of Acts as the early church struggles to stay in step with the Spirit. It isn't assimilation. It isn't resistance. This way is a way of humility. It's a hopeful humility that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's humility. And so I wanna take us to Acts chapter 15. It was just read for us a moment ago. But I wanna look at this passage of scripture because this, this church that we encounter in Acts chapter 15, these are Jewish leaders that are leading the church. This is a church who understands themselves as a remnant people. Uh, not only have they inherited kind of a remnant mindset from their Jewish tradition and from their forefathers, but they've also, they're the ones who've been kicked out of the synagogue now and are facing persecution from their own Jewish people. And so they're kind of a remnant of a remnant at this point. And so here they are kind of hunkered down, holding out. And there is a great, there's this pivotal moment that we're gonna look at in the church, a pivotal moment And and there is this temptation, you can feel it in the room, to take on this defensive posture of resistance or uh, to to kind of accommodate their posture and, 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 um, you know, just give in to the Jewish culture. It'd be so much easier for them to just do that. And yet this defensive or this accommodating posture, neither of these postures are what allows the church to grow. And yet from, from Acts chapter 15 on, I mean, really before that, but there's something, there's something, uh, something breaks loose in Acts chapter 15. And you see the church just explode from here until the end of the book of Acts and really beyond that. Something happens in this room that takes them from this posture of defensiveness or this temptation to assimilate to this posture of, of wide-eyed hopeful humility empowered by the Holy Spirit. I want to look at it together. So I want to go to Acts 15. I want to peek into this conversation that they're having in this room in Jerusalem, this this room where it all happened. Anybody Hamilton fans in the room? Like, you know, I want to sing it. I'm not going to because I have children who have the entire soundtrack memorized and they would be angry with me. But I know some of you want to sing it too. But it's this, this, is the, this is like the theme song when I read Acts 15 is the room where it all happened. Except, you know, instead of no one being in the room where it happened, it turns out in Acts 15, everyone was in the room where it happened. You have Peter there and Paul and Barnabas and James and all of these Jewish leaders, they've all come together for this pivotal moment. And it's just like Hamilton. I mean, we've got politics, we've got strong personalities, we've got arguments going on, we've got intrigue. There's this intense conversation happening. Only the thing is, it's not the fate of the nation that's at stake. It's literally the gospel that's at stake right here. So, so here we are. We're joining with these Jerusalem leaders, in, and they, they are a remnant people. And the church is facing a crisis. The question that they're asking is, can Gentiles be saved without being circumcised? And so first Peter gets up to speak, and then Paul and Barnabas and finally James— and these are all good, faithful Jews. These are, these are good guys. And what everyone was expecting them to say when they stood up, especially, certainly James and Peter, they were expecting them to say something along the lines of, well, we are a faithful remnant. We must preserve our way that's been handed to us by our fathers. We can't let these Gentiles come in you know, with their cultic worship and their pagan worldview. Like we have, to, we have to build the walls higher. We have to make the hoops that they need to jump through. No one no one's actually arguing that Gentiles can't get saved, that that's an impossibility. I think, you know, that's, that's, that question's already been answered. Answer. Gentiles can get saved. Gentiles can become part of the church. The question is, what are we going to require of them to actually belong? Are we going to make them walk like us and talk like us and act like us? And yet what these 
these folks stand up and say in that room that day is not what everyone expected them to say. Instead, they began to argue that God was raising up a faithful remnant outside of Israel, outside of God's chosen people, outside of the Jewish church, that God was expanding their idea of what a faithful remnant even was. If you've been here the last few weeks, maybe you've seen Steve, he pulls the whiteboard out all dramatically and he writes on it. I'm not gonna do that for you today. But he, he draw, he, just a few weeks ago, he drew this circle that represents God's people. And then he drew a, a, a little tiny circle in the middle of that that was the, the, the faithful remnant. And that is true. And that is the framework that these guys are working with here. But what James is suggesting as we keep going and as he points back to the prophet Amos is that there is another circle and it sits outside of that great big circle and it's it's outside of the circle altogether. It is this faithful remnant that God is raising up outside of the church. So first Peter gets up and he recounts his experience with the conversion of Cornelius his whole household that gets saved in Acts chapter 10. And he points out that God gave the spirit to Cornelius and to his uncircumcised family. He argues that why would Jewish leaders require, like why would we uh, you know, put this heavy burden of the law on these Gentiles when their forefathers couldn't carry that heavy burden and when they couldn't even carry that burden? He says in uh, verse 11, We believe it is through the grace of Jesus that we are saved just as they are. It's all about the grace. And so then Paul and Barnabas stand up next and they just start telling stories. I love it. They're just telling stories from their first missionary journey of all these things that happened. And just in case anyone thinks that the story about Cornelius from Peter is some outlier, like, you know, Cornelius is special. He's some, uh, you know, uh, special exception to the rule. Paul and, Paul and Barnabas just go through, man, like story after story of everywhere they went when they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Gentiles received the word and they were filled with the spirit. And then finally, James stands up. He gets up with this mic drop moment <laughs> and, and he really decides the matter in this moment, what he says. He, he does something. He points to scripture. He goes back to Amos chapter nine and he quotes straight from verses 11 and 12 to support this idea that, you know, including the Gentiles and the people of God. He starts in in verse 15 and he starts out by saying, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this. So he's talking about all the words of all the prophets. He's saying they are all in agreement with what we've been talking about, what Peter has said, what Paul, Barnes, what I said. It's all in agreement with this as it is written. And then he hones in on this passage in the end of Amos chapter nine. He says, after this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. That idea of of David's tent is a big idea here and we're gonna come back to it. But he says, uh, rebuild David's tent. It's ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may see the Lord. And and that those words, when Amos, that, that section of scripture there, when you go back and you read it in Amos chapter nine, Amos refers to the remnant of Edom. Edom was Israel's greatest enemy. They hated the Edomites. That that imprecatory psalm about smashing babies' heads on rocks, if you've ever heard that one, that's about the Edomites. Like, they were not fans, okay? And here is Amos saying, suggesting that God is raising up a faithful remnant right out of the middle of Israel's greatest enemies. And and so James just keeps going and and he keeps um, uh, going with that as he quotes from the book of Amos. He says, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. So, So here's this pivotal moment in God's story. 
James points to Amos to redefine the identity of their mission, of their purpose as a remnant people. And, and he's going, yes, like we are a remnant people, but, but God is raising up a movement outside of the church. And it's hard for us to imagine, I think, like just how uh, upside down, how crazy this would have sounded to the people in that room that day. It felt like a brand new idea to them. But James demonstrates when he points back to Amos that actually this is not a brand new idea. This is a very, very old idea. Amos refers to this tent of David, which by the way, that, that word tent that shows up here, it's the same word that John uses in John 1.14 to talk about how God dwelt with us. It's actually the verb form that God tented or tabernacled with us. This, this idea of this tent of David fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, our family, uh, a while ago, I bought a tent for Jeremy for Father's Day. It seemed like an appropriate Father's Day gift. It was a five-man tent. At the time, we had three kids, so that seemed like, seemed like a mansion to us. And then we had, you know, there were, there were four of us, and then there were five of us, and then there were six of us. We're still all cramming into this five-man tent. And then we got a dog. We're still cramming into the five-man tent. And then our little four people started growing and they got you know, bigger and taller. Finally, Jeremy and I just somewhat recently came to the conclusion, maybe we, uh, maybe we need to upgrade the five-man tent to something that actually fits our family. And so we got rid of it. We threw it out and we got a new tent. <laughs> What's interesting that Amos, that Amos was talking about this tent of David. He was actually a shepherd. He would have been very familiar with the Bedouin tents of his day. A Bedouin would never throw out a tent, never. They would never throw it away. In fact, what they would do is they were made, these tents were made of goat hair and they would collect the goat hair all year long. And then once a year, they would take maybe the most worn section of that tent and they would rip it out and they would replace it with a new section. They never threw it out. If a kid got married, rather than sending them off with a brand new tent, no, no, no. They would just, they would add another section to the tent. They would expand the tent as the family grew. They never threw out a tent. The tent was handed down from father to son without its being completely new or completely old at any one time. And in this mic drop, moment for James and really for the early church that changed the trajectory of the gospel, that opened up and expanded the tent for the Gentiles. James connects salvation back to Amos and really back to the story that has been unfolding since the very beginning of time, that God's purposes have always been about expanding the tent of David that God is raising up a remnant outside of the tent. And, and the momentum and the expansion of the gospel that you see right here from Acts chapter 15 on is right here in this moment where they reframe their idea of expanding this tent of David. So, so it's not about assimilating it's not about resisting. The framework, the mindset for a remnant people, if we really trace its course all the way through scripture, is a mindset of humility. And I wanna talk about two kind of characteristics of this humble, focused remnant people. One is a hopeful humility. A hopeful humility. Friends, when are we gonna stop acting like the church is falling apart and crumbling? Yeah, we're a remnant, but we are not the kind of remnant that has to hunker down and hold out. We should be encouraged. The, the days of tearing down are over. I mean, when, when these guys in Acts 15 figured out where they were in the story of God, 
it changed everything for them. They were not in a season of tearing down. They were in a season of rebuilding. Amos said that God would rebuild David's tent and restore it. So today is a day of expanding the tent, of letting more people in. We don't have to wring our hands in despair. Sometimes I go, man, to my own self, I say, where is the uh, optimistic hopefulness that Wesleyans are supposed to be known for? That holy optimism. Where is that? No, we are a humble people with a humble humility of hopefulness. Holy Spirit is the second one. So hopeful humility, the second one is Holy Spirit humility. Um, I think the danger sometimes of, you know, talking about this expanding tent, like it can kind of sound a little bit like universalism, like, you know, everyone's welcome in the tent, doesn't matter what you believe or how you live your life, like, come on in. And um, that's actually not what's going on in Amos. It's certainly not what's going on in Acts chapter 15. There was a consistent witness of the Spirit all the way through. Notice every example from Cornelius all the way down underscored the witness of the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, God is raising up a movement inside the church, outside the church, but it will be aligned with Scripture and it will be marked by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. I think sometimes I look at that, that group of people in Acts 15 in that room where it all happened, and I think, man, they almost missed it. I think sometimes, you know, we think the question at play here is, oh man, I wonder, will the Gentiles be included in the early church? But actually, I think it's the other way around. I think the real question is, will the Jewish Christians be included in what God was already doing? The movement of the Holy Spirit that had already caused the church to expand into Asia Minor, into places that, that uh, you know, Paul had never even set foot in. The church was already there. And so there is this idea of, man, we don't want to miss it. God is going to do what he set out to do. He promised that he would rebuild the tent of David. He is already doing. The question is, will we see it? Will we join in? Okay, I want to offer a couple of examples, not because they're exhaustive by any means, but just to get us going, what does this look like today? I don't know. You know, we're not dealing with the circumcision issue so much here. Well, here's an example of a movement that God is raising up on the margins. You know, we've talked about it already, like membership in the church attendance um, is on the decline in North America and established churches. But Christianity is booming in the global South, in Latin America, Africa, Asia. Uh, you know, there were a little less than 100 million Christians in the world in 1970. Today, we have close to 350 million Christians. And I'll tell you, the vast majority of that expansion has been in the majority world, in the global South. In the next five to seven years, experts predict that China will have more Christians in their country than any other country on the planet. The largest church in Europe right now is an Afro-Caribbean church in Metro City, London, whose pastor is Nigerian. Like, like this is, the Holy Spirit is erupting and moving all over the world. And you guys know this, the U.S. has more immigrants than any other country in the world. And many of those people are coming from the majority world and they are bringing their faith with them. People who say that the church in America is crumbling, they are overlooking Global South Christians who are revitalizing the religious landscape. Do you know that Latino evangelicals are by far, not even close, the fastest group of evangelical, fastest growing group of evangelicals in North America today? Friends, God is raising up a remnant. I don't want to miss it. Okay, here's another example. Uh, you know, Gen Z is a great example of this. I sometimes hear people talk about 
Gen Z, like, I don't know. No offense, Gen Z people in the room. Sometimes people say these things about you that, you know, Gen Z's entitled or fragile or, um, you know, directionless or lost or lazy, these kinds of ideas. And I work with Gen Z, so this is kind of like, you know, my thing, all right? So I get a little defensive, but here's the deal. I talk to young people all the time. I talk to young people all the time who have encountered more suffering, more brokenness, more opposition, but they've also encountered more breakthrough, more personal experiences with the power of the Holy Spirit than I have in my whole 40 years. (laughs) Young people who have this, this felt need, this hunger for more of God that I don't think I had categories or language for it until much later in my life. I think of the young people that College Wesleyan Church sent out a week ago on the adventure trip, our youth, about 50, I don't know, youth, who went to to New York State and they're camping and serving. They're on their way back right now. Man, uh, get to know some of these students. Listen to their stories. Some of these young people have already faced more opposition just walking into their high school every day than you and I ever have. And some of that opposition is from other people, but honestly, a lot of the opposition is just from the enemy. They are a faithful remnant. The power and the authority of the Holy Spirit rests on them. They don't need to go build a new tent. We need to expand our tent and welcome them in and learn from them. But here's the thing. what God's doing in the global South and what he's doing in Gen Z, he's doing right here. He's rebuilding and expanding his tent right here in Marion Friends. And uh, it's probably not gonna look like what you think it should look like, but it's happening. The Holy Spirit is erupting in small and large places It's in the recovery community in Marion. It's in our local high schools. It's on IWU campus. It's happening in your workplace. It's happening in our families. And the question is, will we have eyes to see it? To be the people standing at the edge of the tent, expanding it out. I think it changes the way that we pray. We don't pray. We pray with urgency, but not an urgency that the world is falling apart. We pray with urgency that God is rebuilding David's tent. It changes the way we expect the spirit to move and to show up. It changes the way that we see the people around us. I think the question is, God, where have you, where have you been working in my life? In my tiny little world, where has the Holy Spirit already been erupting? Like, who is the person that you see something unique, something different, something new happening there? Guess what? It's not new. It's very, very old. But where is the Holy Spirit working? Go there. Be the one to open up the tent and to make room. As we move into a time of prayer, let me pray for you. Oh, God. Give us your heart. Give us a heart marked by hopefulness, by humility. Help us to walk in step with your spirit as we join you in the good work of rebuilding your tent. In your name.